You're listening to Pedia Pain Focus, episode number 41. And today, we tackle how to navigate the waters of disagreement, misalignment, and differences in opinion related to your patient's pain care, be it with your patients, their families, and or other healthcare professionals. So, stay tuned. Pedia Pain Focus. You're listening to Pedia Pain Focus, brought to you by Proactive Pain Solutions. Pedia Pain Focus highlights pediatric pain information and provides tools and resources for all healthcare professionals taking care of children dealing with pain. Here's your host, Dr. Anjana Kundu. Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of Pedia Pain Focus. I'm your host, Dr. Anjana Kundu. Now, 2020 has been, well, we all know what it has been. Challenging, to say the least. But let's admit it. It has had its saving grace as well. We got a chance to bond with our loved ones in ways that we never imagined. It seems like the whole world just became a little bit smaller. We've learned to cook, paint, sew, garden, bake, and we've done thousand other things that we had been putting off previously. Some people got that long break from work or the flexibility that they had craved and dreamt about but never thought it would happen. Who am I kidding? It may have happened for some, but for healthcare professionals, we kind of got reamed by this pandemic, especially our colleagues who care for the adult patients. And on top of that, we've had to homeschool our kids as well. So... It's kind of been a mixed bag with mostly a lot of undesirable items and maybe a few good ones too. And one of those bright spots or good things that we've had in 2020 has been this availability of the COVID vaccine so expeditiously. It's a phenomenal and historic effort from our scientific community as well as the industry to manufacture and transport and get it to the people. Well, that remains to be seen how well it gets distributed, but at least it has been started. Now, this availability of the vaccine obviously hasn't come without its own controversies, concerns, trepidations, disagreement, or even differences of opinion, with the total enthusiasm on one side of the aisle and pretty significant skepticism on the other. But then again... What's new about that? Vaccines are especially prone to provoking and evoking these diametrically opposing views from people. So the COVID vaccine's getting its own share as well. Which now brings me to the reason for today's episode. The differences or malalignment or misalignment of opinions when it comes to pediatric pain care. We know that differences and misalignments of opinions is pretty commonplace in healthcare. And when it occurs in children's pain care, it's not just common, but it also can be very complex and a very multi-layered issue, with misalignment happening between the wishes of the patient and their caregivers, for example, or the misalignment between the caregiver and the healthcare professional, and or between two or various other healthcare professionals that are involved in this child's care. You get the point. As healthcare professionals, we know that it's not uncommon to be in a situation where our perceptions, assessment, or treatment plan may be at odds with those of our patients, their caregivers, or even from those of our referring or consulting healthcare professionals that are involved in this patient's care, right? What I mean is that perhaps You, as one of the professionals, is recommending a medication or a non-pharmacological treatment plan that your patient does not want, or they may be seeking a particular therapy, or perhaps a diagnostic, or a referral, or a test, which you may deem unnecessary or inappropriate even. Or perhaps they may have been referred to you by another professional with a certain preset expectations. That was not said by you, but the referring provider, and which may be completely not aligned with what you determine with your assessment. The changing landscape of healthcare with evolving expectations from healthcare professionals, especially for those that are physicians, and the blending boundaries of scope of practice, the free and widely available medical health information, 
They all contribute to and impact nature and the health of Therapeutic Alliance and ultimately the healthcare outcomes that our patients have. And I've addressed these issues in more details in last week's episode or the episode 40, which I will link in the show notes. And I've also addressed how it is imperative that we embrace our role as a physician leader, especially to address some of these challenges and these evolutions that have happened in the healthcare. So I encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. Now, how we navigate it so that it does not leave anyone involved feeling bad or hurt or estranged, be it your patients or their caregivers or you yourself or the colleagues that you deal with. Now, that is a billion dollar question, literally, because it costs billions in healthcare expenditure each year for pediatric pain. So, in order to navigate these entangled and enmeshed issues, We really need to understand a few things, and those are, when do these issues or situations arise? In what settings? What circumstances? Number two, when they do arise, what should you as a healthcare professional do when you're faced with these issues? And finally, of course, is how do you do it? So let's look at them one by one. Number one, when do such misalignments occur? They can happen in any of these situations. When it comes to patients and caregivers, it may occur in the situations when they're still seeking diagnosis or cure, and they haven't really accepted that it's chronic pain issue, and now it's all about management rather than seeking for a diagnosis, which may or may not be obvious as we healthcare professionals who are involved in chronic pain management know that it's often hard to find the exact cause. Number two, the parents of your patients may feel that you or other healthcare professionals are missing something important, So, which may lead to the point number one that we talked about, that they're still seeking the diagnosis. Number three, they haven't been believed by other healthcare professionals. Because we know that typically our pain patients have seen multiple healthcare professionals, multiple providers, whether they're within your system or outside, before they actually are evaluated by a pain expert such as you. And this shunting from referral to referral, provider to provider, can sometimes unintentionally lead them to believe that they're not being believed that somehow they're being made to feel that they're making this situation up, which often, as you know, as healthcare professionals, we don't mean to. But how we deliver that information is really important as well, because how that comes across to the patients and their families is what really determines how they are going to process that information and what are they going to make with that. Number four, They may have certain underlying cultural or religious or community beliefs or spiritual beliefs that may impact their choices and the decisions that may they make around their child's pain care. Number five, they may have seen non-traditional healers or providers who may have given them diagnoses or lab works to suggest a diagnosis that is really not consistent with anything that we in traditional allopathic medical practices know. For example, a chiropractor or a naturopath may have given them certain terminology or certain diagnoses or have run a test that isn't really supported by the medical literature or medical scientific discovery that we know. There's a naturopath in Vermont that runs a test that claims that he provides bioresonance analysis of health, a fancy terminology I know. But he claims that it's a method to measure the electromagnetic frequencies of using a single drop of blood, and this can be used to pinpoint underlying dysfunction in the body, and therefore he can accurately diagnose and then treat these patients. We all know that if there was something like that, we would all be using it. The allopathic medicine, the traditional medicine will be all over it and we wouldn't have the issues that we're having today. Number six, it may occur when your referring colleague or consulting colleague has set a different expectation for your patient or families. 
before coming to your consultation or your evaluation. And for example, as an anesthesiologist, I can tell you and all of you who are anesthesiologists in the audience know that a lot of times you will see a note from a primary healthcare provider that says cleared for anesthesia or your surgeon or another healthcare professional, a non-anesthesiologist may tell the patient or comment or put a note suggesting the type of anesthesia or pain medicine that they should have. Now, all these situations do set up a situation of malalignment and likelihood of differences in opinion because your expertise may determine something differently. So what are the situations where this disagreement or differences of opinion may occur with other healthcare professionals? Well, number one, you are all coming to the table with different set of expertise, different perspective, and therefore different assessments of your patient's condition, right? And if there is no regular communication, that can set up a situation where these differences of opinion can impact patient's care or their expectations. Number two, perhaps your primary care has a certain goal for this patient and that's what they're focused on. They haven't actually, they don't actually have the perspective you have in terms of how this patient can be led to that point that these patients may or may not be ready to follow the path of progression that's been set up by the primary team or at at least planned for this patient. So in other words, their focus has been primarily driven by the area of expertise that they bring in and what they feel needs to be done in the big picture. However, they may have missed the little details that you as an expert in that particular area, as the pain expert, might be able to highlight. Giving you an example would be when The surgeons or even the primary medical team wants the patient to be transitioned to oral analgesia, but they've missed the point that the patient is having significant nausea and or diarrhea that may impact their administration of route of these medications that they may not tolerate the oral route or the enteral route yet. So those are typically the most common situations that you are going to encounter other than the fact that if it's a non-traditional allopathic healthcare professional, you can obviously have those differences of opinion there as well because they are not well versed with your traditional method or allopathic method of healthcare and you are not versed in their approaches to treatment assessment and management as well. But the patients and families don't know that. They will go to anyone who can give them some hope to get their child's pain better. So what do you do when you're faced with that situation? So that brings us to our next section. Once these malalignment and disagreement occur, what should you do as a healthcare professional? Well, what we should do is try to bridge that gap, that difference of opinion, that misalignment, right? We should bring that into alignment. But clearly, we need to do that tactfully, skillfully, and with a viewpoint that these are opportunities for learning, discovering, and understanding, and teaching each other. So, what should we do? First and foremost, we should remember our code of ethics. We must recognize our responsibility to our patients first and foremost, as well as to the society, to the healthcare professionals, and to ourselves as the physicians or the healthcare professionals that are taking care of these patients. The AMA regularly publishes and updates this code of ethics from time to time. And I've included a link to the last update of these, this code of ethics in the show notes. So be sure to check out. It's just a short document, short one page document. Now, these are not laws, but basically standards of conduct that define the essentials of an honorable behavior on the part of a physician or any independently practicing healthcare clinician. So what is our responsibility to our patient? Well, Turning to our Hippocratic Oath, it is do no harm. And this, of course, can be controversial in itself if we start to really take it literally. 
And in which case, we would never do or recommend surgery, we would never do or recommend invasive pain-causing procedures or order tests that may lead to such painful procedures or recommend medications that may cause severe side effects. Think chemotherapy, right? But in reality, what it means is that Doctors should help their patients as much as they can by recommending tests or treatments for which the potential benefits outweigh the risk of harm. So it's not do no harm, it is look at it as weighted risk of the harm. So if we keep those code of ethics and our Hippocratic Oath in mind to balance the potential benefit versus risk, so that you can minimize the harm to our patient, that would be a pretty good guide. That's what we should do. That's the first and foremost thing. In addition, we should utilize all the resources that will help us do that, that will help us determine this risk-benefit ratio more effectively. So what are those? One of the things we need to do is know and understand and be aware of when it's appropriate even acknowledge the limits of our medical knowledge or even our own personal biases and limits, whether it's related to our knowledge, expertise, or our belief and implicit biases. We need to understand those for ourselves as well as how it may impact those around us. Now, we know that there are no objective tests for a lot of the chronic pain conditions. So telling our patients that tests are normal doesn't really help much. It doesn't actually absolve us of our responsibility that we may not have. That the fact is we may not have a test to evaluate the etiopathology of our patient's condition appropriately, nor does it absolve us of the responsibility to explain that to our patients and families that these normal tests are only relevant to that particular situation that we may have been investigating or looking at the cause for. But it does not negate that the patient is actually experiencing the pain. It does not nullify their pain experience somehow. And doing this will establish your patients and families' trust in you that even if you don't have the answers, you are at least open and honest with them. So the bottom line is you're focusing on the patient in front of you, right? You make them feel heard and believed. You understand their goals. You understand their values, their needs. And that is what's really important. Because remember, no one cares how much you know unless they know how much you care. Now, the next point is pretty obvious. You know, we should avoid our conversation, our interaction with our patient from appearing as argumentative. Even when we do not agree with our patients, even if we want them to do something completely different, even when we know that what they are saying, their goals and their values and their needs are at odds with what is best for them. Even then, what we want to avoid is this appearance of adversaries. We are supposed to be in the same team. Your patient came to you to seek help and you are there to provide them that help. By appearing argumentative or contrary will only increase the perceived power differential that exists between patients and especially physicians. And it will mar that relationship and that trust. It will erode that trust. Another thing that we need to do is use empathy and compassion to lead our patients to where they need to be, but wrapping it up in the acknowledgement of where they want to be. So as they say, sell them what they want and give them what they need. I'm sure you're thinking, well, I'm not there to sell anything. They came to me. But my friends, as you know, we are always selling something, whether we're interacting with our own children, our parents, our friends, our families, our society, no matter where we are, we are always selling our perspective, our point of view, our opinions, our feelings, our needs, whatever it might be. So it's no different with patients either. 
I know we don't want to think about it that way because we're professionals and we have expertise. But the fact of the matter is that's exactly what we're doing all the time in all spheres of our lives. You know, just keep in mind, often our destinations are the same, whether it's your patient and their caregiver or us, we all ultimately want them to be out of pain, to be functional, to be moving forward in their lives, right? But the, this destination, these goals may be hidden behind or disguised by, or they may be skewed by other filters that all of us carry as human beings from our previous experiences, the words and beliefs of those that our patients may already trust and you're a new entity to them. So what you need to do is you have to get them to the point where they feel like they can trust you. And that has to be done all in that brief visit, very tactfully and very expeditiously and very efficiently. So that brings us to the how. So how do we do that when we have limited time, when we only can do so much? Well, as in some of our other episodes, which again, I will link in the show notes, we've discussed that if you don't think that you have enough time to address it in one visit, then you only tackle the part that you can address and that you feel is the most important in rapport building and in getting the engagement from the patient. So tackle that one first and then revisit the rest of the issues for a next visit or a second evaluation. And there is no harm, no foul done in that. As a matter of fact, your patients may be happy that you are taking your time and due diligence to lead them to the best outcomes, that you care, that you want to partner with them and take them to a better place. And how can we do that? Well, we need to be aware of our own knowledge, limitations, beliefs, biases, whether they're implicit or explicit, as we enter into this therapeutic alliance, this relationship with our patient, right? We have to be aware of our own beliefs, as well as be able to understand those of our patients, as we just discussed in what you should do. Remember, this is not about us. This is not about you. It is about them, your patient. It's about your patients, the families, the caregivers, and your other colleagues, whoever may be concerned in that situation. It is about their beliefs and their goals, even more so than your own. So what we do is we evaluate and understand our patient's goal and reference points. Where are they coming from? What is impacting their pain behaviors? What is impacting their pain experience? What is impacting their ability to progress? What is impacting their choices or the goals and the needs that they are communicating to you? Or maybe they're not even communicating, but that you actually need to understand. Number two, make sure that whatever you communicate with your patient is done effectively. So effective communication is going to be a big factor here. And that would include building rapport, understanding what is important to your patient. And how do you do that? One of the simple examples that I use for my patients is I ask them a simple question. What does a good day or a good outcome look like for you? Because then that puts the onus on the patient to communicate where do they want to be? What do they want? What does it look like? So it's no longer, I just want to feel better. It is more like, what does it look like? What would it mean for you to feel better? What will you be able to do? What will it allow you to achieve if you had that good day or a good outcome? And it gives them that power. It gives them that belief that you actually care, that they are actually partnering with you rather than you just delivering some treatment plans to them. Of course, how we communicate is very important as well. We need to choose our words wisely because words matter. We need to choose the words that create a balance between regard and respect for your patient or family's values and their goals and their opinions no matter how ridiculous or unrealistic you think they might be, but you still need to take those into consideration 
and balance those with the objective scientific evidence, whether it's for or against whatever it is that these patients are and families are seeking from you. And that is the mark of a true expert. Another thing that's really important is your body language, how you interact with your patient, how you make your entry and introduce yourself. Do you sit down or do you give them that impression that you're another number that you, they have to get, that you, you are trying to get through? Make them feel that they matter, even from your body language. Don't interrupt them. If you're asking them a question and if you feel like they are going off on a tangent, try to gently redirect them to the main issue without cutting them off, without interrupting them. It's not about you checking the boxes. It's about you understanding your patient's desires, needs, their pain. And by pain, I don't mean just their physical pain, but the other pain points that they may have, their barriers so that you can get them past this stuck point, so that you are not one of the many people that have failed to believe them or failed to make them feel heard in the past. Another thing you do is provide honest, kind, and respectful opinion, which is balanced with the scientific expertise and or the tried and tested measures, because we know that in pain, there's a lot that still needs to be discovered. A lot of it is unknown and th some things work, some don't. So you have to be able to present that information to your patients in a way that appears honest and aligned with their thoughts and opinions and respectful of and validating of their needs, even though they might be completely contrary to what they initially wanted. And that's where the skill comes. Ultimately, the quality of the therapeutic alliance can do more for a patient's healing than any pill, procedure, or therapy that you're going to prescribe for them. So when we, as healthcare professionals, infuse the expert knowledge with kindness, empathy, compassion, and empowering interactions for our patients, we can really create therapeutic miracles. And that is magic. Now, this kind of interaction is also referred to as the therapeutic interaction. And this is a process of interacting with your patients that focuses on advancing the physical as well as their emotional well-being. This empowers your patient, which is one of your goals, of course, and should be your goals. It empowering your patients, their caregivers, and also when you're interacting with your colleagues, this applies there as well, right? You need to empower, educate, and partner with your colleagues. You should share some of that knowledge that will help them make better and more aligned decisions in the future. Share what you know. Give them the resources that they, they can review or evaluate on their own before they can make their decisions the next time. And finally, what we all need to do is we need to handle our own emotions. We should not evaluate our patient or caregivers by what we would do because we are not our patients and families. They have their own filters, own reference points, and their own life situations that are impacting their ability or inability to do what they seek, what you want them to do. So we should keep our emotional biases and responses separate from how we care for our patients. Now, this discussion would be incomplete if I did not address what would you do if it was your colleague or a referring provider or another healthcare professional who has set different expectations for your patients that are now presenting to you in your clinic. Now, a lot of what we've already dis discussed still applies to this, right? All that, you know, evaluating and empathy, compassion, your communication, all those are going to be still relevant, right? But what, in addition, what's important is that we actually make sure to reach out and communicate with our colleagues that may have led to the situation, because it may be just as simple as picking up a phone, writing an email, a text that 
can help clarify that there was no missed information. There was no missed interpretation because the patient may have heard or interpreted something completely different than what your colleague had said or meant to say. Unless, of course, it is in writing, in which case you can directly, again, pick up the phone or reach out to your colleague and discuss that. And it doesn't need to be done while the patient is in your office. You can do it afterwards as well, as long as it does not impact your ability to provide the care there and then. Another good thing besides clearing up that misconception and or getting on the same page with your referring or collaborating healthcare professional, the other thing it's doing is that it actually gives your patients and care and their caregivers more confidence in you as a healthcare professional, that you care enough, that you actually are respectful of not just your patients' needs, but also respectful of how you interact with your other colleagues. So it establishes more trust in you as a healthcare professional. Number two, even if you are not able to connect with them, or even if you're pretty sure, like I said, they've written it down clear in the notes that, and it is in complete contradiction to what you think is necessary and needed, please avoid undermining. Even when you may wholeheartedly disagree with your colleagues, or you may know that it's an inappropriate or unreasonable plan that their patient has been communicated by someone else. Undermining would not help. It wouldn't help your patient. It wouldn't help your relationship with your healthcare professional. It wouldn't help your future referrals and collaborations even. Avoid chart wars. So don't do what they just might have done, writing completely unnecessary plan or inappropriate, inapplicable plan. Don't do that. Don't start chart wars saying that was inappropriate. It's always better to clear it up. If it's something simple, you can do that by phone call, as I said. If it's not, or if it's multiple healthcare professionals involved in this care, then you can request a setup of a team meeting or what is now called an alliance consultation which means that if there are multiple healthcare professionals involved in the patient care, for example, in complex pain care patients, you may have a gastroenterologist, an infectious disease, uh, the social worker, the psychologist, the physical therapist, the ICU attending, any number of professionals, in which case you may want to bring in these healthcare professionals to the table and discuss this patient's care in details because each one of you are expert in your your own areas and each one of your assessment has an implication on the other one's management. So you might as well collaborate and align this and take your patient's healthcare as a coordinated effort. And I understand that these team meetings and what I call the alliance consultations may not be easy to achieve, but sometimes they're necessary, especially for very complex patients. And you may need to communicate that to your patient that we need to have that discussion. Again, it is not going to upset them. It's likely to make them feel more heard and cared for. So now I hope that this has given you a nice framework to handle these situations, both with your colleagues as well as most importantly with your patients and families, should such situations arise. And oh, believe me, arise they will. Even though I've given you this framework, we definitely dive even deeper into the specifics of how we do this in our Proactive Pain Solution Physician Academy curriculum that we teach our physicians, which, by the way, currently our academy is open for just early admissions, and that's only happening through December 31st of this year. So if you're interested, or if you know someone else then please feel free to apply to the Academy. And obviously I'll include that in the show notes as well. Or you can simply visit our website at www.proactivepainsolutions.com and you can enroll directly there as well. 
But for now, let me ask you, how do you handle these situations when you are in malalignment or in, you know, disagreement with your patients, families, or your other colleagues and where your opinions are not aligned with them? How do you handle that? Also, let us know what resonates with you from today's episode. Are there any other tools or approaches that you're using that we haven't covered here, that we may have not covered here? Share with us in the comments and share this episode with someone that you think might benefit from hearing this information. And lastly, as I always ask, please take a minute to review our podcast. It will automatically get it into bigger circulation and get it to people who actually need to see this information even more so than you may. So you'll be doing a solid for us and for other healthcare professionals, for your other colleagues. That's all for today, folks. I will be back in a week with another new episode. And until then, be proactive, stay safe. Bye now. Pedia Pain Focus is a presentation of Proactive Pain Solutions, a company committed to transforming pediatric pain care through improved access, quality, and expertise. There is a large gap in children's pain management. Did you know one in three school-age children are suffering from chronic pain? That's 19 million children in the U.S. alone. Meanwhile, there are only a handful of programs that provide pediatric pain medicine training. This leaves children's pain in the care of hands of untrained healthcare professionals and results in frustration for both the groups, patients and their healthcare professionals. Data clearly shows that untreated or poorly treated children's pain leads to much higher incidence of chronic pain into adult and mental health diagnosis and a huge societal burden. Proactive Pain Solutions Academy is the answer to this major problem. It fills this large gap through our comprehensive, evidence-based virtual training, which is bolstered by live Q&A sessions, personalized mentorship, and leadership training development. Now, our enrollment only opens for a limited time and only for a limited number of spots. So join our early bird wait list today and be the first one to know as soon as our doors open. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity to have the expertise at your fingertips, the expertise that will help you improve your patient outcomes and satisfaction as you watch your own confidence and professional satisfaction soar. So join us today.